Okay. Actually, let's say a lot of what we're going to do. So we're going to. It's okay. So we've got together and looked at our presentations beforehand. And also, this morning, of course, was talked about the actual um, CBT and BDD as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and focus on some of the specific things I think are important, which is telling you what good CBT is, but also actually then going through some of the questions, specific questions that people have put up here as well. And we can try and do that and then hopefully open it up for more questions on that. So I'm going to jump a bit in my slides, if that's okay. Um, I don't like giving David too much credit, but in <laughs> fact, um, this is actually pretty, oh, pretty good. And um, if you haven't got it, it's actually really useful. Self-help guide, it does outline those things. At the back, it has got lots of resources, um, both in the UK and other countries as well. And it's actually brilliant for that. Um, I'm sure you know about BDD, so I don't need to talk about that. Some of the, the needs of people have said that is that early recognition, information, respect and understanding, and then not just the treatment, what to do in relapse, support groups, and awareness of family and carers' needs. I'm sure I'm not telling you anything that you lot don't know as well. So this is the step care approach that, that Clip's talking about that's for um, the NHS in this country as well, that they should provide, this is taken directly from the NICE guidelines, at different levels from awareness to recognition in primary care and hospital settings, initial management through GP practice, which is your source to go through, so the, uh, meeting your GP and then understanding your problem is your first big hurdle. Okay? Um, you all deserve this treatment, you all deserve to get it, so you do have to be persistent. Um, for many years, I get lots of phone calls from people who find that so difficult, but you do have to just keep banging away. You will get it in the end, and you will get the right one. You're worth it. You have to keep going. But those hurdles, you have to see them as steps to get the right treatment. And it's mainly for that for your GP. And then you'll get the local services involved, and then in getting specific expertise involved right up to level six, which may be many specialist intensive treatment programs. As well. So there, that is a step care approach that's in the NICE guidelines and it's explained at each step the levels which relates to, to what Colette said about getting treatment in this country. I know it's patchy throughout the country but it's there and available and you need to be persistent. If you're not getting it you say, I mean I would always recommend like that says, printing that out, printing the NICE guidelines out and saying I'm at this stage, I need you now to help me get to that stage, get that help. You shouldn't be afraid to do that, you should be, you know, this is what you deserve and it's your right to get it. So that's who's responsible for each step going up as well. Okay, so I can go past that and go to what CBT, good CBT looks like. Okay, adequate CBT in my mind is, there's two things. I, I'm going to slightly disagree with Colette about um, liking your therapist, okay? Because I think... You, and I, I, used to try, I used to run the CBT course, so I trained a CBT therapists in my time. I went for seven years at the Institute of Psychiatry and trained the CBT therapists. And CBT therapists are different. They are people and they have their foibles. If you have me, you have kind of somebody who talks a lot and waves his arms a lot and speaks too quickly and all these things I know I have as a problem as a therapist. Um, but what you need to do is have enough of a relationship with your therapist. That's the key, it's enough. You don't have to particularly like them, they're not there to be liked, they're there to help you with that process. But you do have to have enough of a relationship, you think, okay, I can work with this person. That's all it has to be, in some ways, enough to have that link with them. Um, and that's because some people um, will go from focus, 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 and never really give somebody a chance to do that. Also, it's really, really important with CBT that you, even though it's really scary and important, to actually be quite upfront about any problems quite quickly in that sense as well. And actually be willing to say, okay, but let's see if we can work on that. I'll work them through and give that a little trial, maybe it's a couple of weeks and try that through. Because that's quite important to do that. So you can actually, because what's more important, underneath all that, hopefully, the therapy is the key thing. And the therapy, as I said this morning, I see often our job, I see myself as like a Jose Mourinho. Probably not much better look of him, obviously. But um, <laughs> I kind of see that, that approach, is that my job is, always, is to be the coach the special one, if you like. Is somebody, but you lot are the world-class players that are actually going to win this game and do the bits. And I can, I can teach you the skills, but as you get more and more skilled, you're the ones that are actually going to go there day to day and live the problem and, and, and actually do that whole bit. And as, you, as I teach you the skills, as the therapy goes on, we'll be much more and more on a peer-to-peer -peer until eventually you don't need me anymore. You need to just check in 
and you can go off with all those skills and you're the Jose Mourinho. Then you become the, the player manager and then the manager and you become the skilled person. Then you'll be standing up here in a couple of years doing your um, inspirational speech as well. So that's just possible. So I see a therapist is sometimes they will be very different and you think, oh God, he's too loud, he's too fast. But you, you need to just work enough with them to get those skills out and get those understanding. These are the things we think are really important that you should have. I said six sessions plus, but for, for BDD, um, it was absolutely right. We should have about, I would say, 15, 20 sessions. You're talking about up to an hour, roughly. There should be a clear rationale about the behaviours and thoughts of the problem. What that means is you should understand what's going on. It shouldn't be all gobbledygook. A person should be able to talk to you in a way that you think, I understand what they're saying here, what the model is, in other words, what the principles behind this therapy is and what's going on. And also, there's one of three kinds of exposure, which actually starting to face your problem. And that's either in real life alone, with a therapist, or in imagination. So there's some part of your, unfortunately, this is kind of a real side effect of um, being a CBT therapist, is that we want to help people, but I spend my life with people crying or being really anxious all the time. And it's quite scary being that person, being the therapist, when you want to really help people, but actually, I mean, I go through boxes of tissues in my sessions. And also, I know that people come back and they've had a horrendous time. So they say, oh, it was really horrible doing that. But, so you kind of have to go through some of that anxiety and pain and difficulties, and it's scary, this treatment, and we're the people doing it. So sometimes, often therapists will find that very difficult as well, because they want to help, but actually we have to allow you to stay with that anxiety and stay with that scariness to build up your confidence and find out, do you know what? I actually can do these things. It's possible to have a, a life worth living. There has to be homework. Um, it always, to me, the homework, the things you do between the sessions are the most important things. The hour, we may see you one, two hours a week, but what's really important is the bits you do between is really key. So I know it's more to talk about one, two percent, but I kind of say, actually, you really want to kind of um, think about an hour a day, maybe even more, an hour and a half, or try and do homework that's there with all your different bits of things in the day, whether it's there's homework with how you get, get ready in the morning, how you prepare to go out, how you're doing these things. So homework should be, it should be a priority to you. It's like undertaking a degree just constantly working on it and reading and, and, and facing these little tasks. The main focus should be on the BDD, not, not on childhood, and the therapist shouldn't be silent for the majority of the session. It's embarrassing. <laughs> okay, well, you, won't, you wouldn't spend the sessions talking about childhood, spend most of the sessions with the therapist silent, get caught up in reassurance about body image. Often you may find, and often it's like, as you may find, your therapist gets caught up discussing, oh yeah, do you know, I think you look really great, and then it's quite a natural thing sometimes for an experienced therapist to do that, because they can see the rewards of, of, of reassuring someone they look okay, because they see in a session the person gets that small bit of reassurance, the small bit of relief, but I'm sure everyone knows who suffers from BDD, that's never going to last, and they don't believe them anyway. They just think they're being nice and they're paid, they're paid to say that, how do they know? But it's quite, so you should be already aware that the therapist has to be quite strong in that, um, should be encouraged to kind of block your thoughts or, to, or give it a mantra. That's not the case. We don't want you to, to um, actually block them and avoid them. We want you to accept them and see your thoughts separately and say, I, I understand all these things, these terrible things I say about myself. And I understand them, but I don't necessarily have to live that and feel that, believe that. I can see them separately. So, it may also involve... Um, listening to recordings, we often recommend that you actually get yourself a little MP3 player. The reason now, you can tape your own sessions. Why not tape your own sessions? You can, you can live the, relive them again, you can play them, it's absolutely fine. And any reasonable CB ther therapist will let you do that, or even encourage you to do that. If you came to Anna's unit, we actually get everybody to tape their own sessions and take them away forever. And the therapist should be willing to, to go and face this stuff with you and do the stuff with you. Um, so you should understand also why you are supposed to do things. If you're kind of asked to do something and you don't understand it, you should be able to say, whoa, hang on a second here, can we just run through that again as to why I'm, you're getting me to um, look at myself in the mirror or do this or hide these things? Why are you getting me to do that? You need to actually have that conversation and understand totally the reasons behind it. Also, you should be allowed an opportunity to be seen with relatives or family members and understand, so they can understand how to best help you as well. 
And that will be seen as kind of a standard part of CB2, really, in that sense as well. So if you've, got, if you've had that, you've had CB2 in the community, but yet it hasn't worked, and you've had maybe specialist CBT, again, as an outpatient, it hasn't worked, the, the top step there is um, intensive treatment or inpatient services. So often, these are for a small proportion of people with BDD, um, and they can have access to specialist experts, which is, um, there's a couple of units, there's David Beals um, Pari, and also we have a residential unit at the Bethlehem. And that's it here. In fact, there's two units, there's this one over there, and there's also one where this picture was taken, if that makes sense. They're joined by this half of hope. <laughs> so they're joined by that as well. Um, and the ADRU journey, it's the picture on the brochures. I think, you've, have you seen the brochures that are out there? It helps out as well. This is painted by one of the residents. And that They saw that their problem, their ACD and BDD, was the kind of unwell in the blackness. And that's it as well. Um, but the CBT is the key. First but at the beginning of the journey, you do need help. You need something to hold your hand and walk you through that process. And as you go through that process, more and more, you can actually start to be freer and freer and start to do more and more things. So you can start to do more and more activities and face yourself until eventually you kind of ride off into your life. So that painting stands at the beginning, of, at the opening of our unit as well. And it's, and it's kind of how we see that process going around. Okay. And these are some of the residential feedbacks. I'm going to go through the questions. Um, did you want to say anything about the unit? It's a, a residential unit, which means um, you come and stay with us for about 12 weeks. Um, we don't have nursing staff, um, so it's a kind of nine to five program where staff are there. Evenings and weekends are for you to, to do your own thing. So it's, it's not like coming into a hospital ward as such, it's more like coming into a it's, it's almost like university hall of residence style of accommodation. Um, you know, you have your own room, you have shared kind of dining areas, shared living areas, but you're part of a community of people who are all working um, towards the same goal and all come in with some kind of anxiety disorder. Um, so although it's on a hospital, it's not like a, an inpatient ward. I think sometimes that's just a little bit ambiguous. That's good. And the other thing to say is that we have, I mean, and that's right, there's, there's kind of three, three ways of getting into our unit. You get your local authority to pay. If you've had um, past treatment before, twice, and you're also on an SSRI, you may be suitable for highly specialised service, which is their nationally funded treatment, which is free, to come to that, or you can come in privately. By far the majority have their local services pay, and then the next most common is people with the highly specialised service. Is that right? In that sense as well. Yeah. That's one about my thing as well. Okay, so um, how do I get a formal diagnosis? Okay, how do you get a formal diagnosis? That formal diagnosis can be made through your GP or you see a consultant. And you have to ask for that as well. That you can go online to the BDT Foundation and it will tell you the kind of, you can look very carefully at the criteria there and see if you meet that as well on the impact in life and the, and the amount of time your, pre your preoccupation is. So you would have a fairly good idea about, do you know what, I think I have BDT. And it's then going to the GP and then being quite persistent in getting actually access to get that a diagnosis made. Either GP or, or consultant will make that diagnosis for you. So that's it. How do I get, how do I get CPD with a how do I get CBT with a BDD qualified therapist? I live in Northamptonshire. And there's also one about how do I get therapists in Scotland? And how do I get one in Ireland, Northern Ireland as well? So how do I get specific ones? Well, in England, you can go on the BABBC, BABCP website, and there are good accredited ones there. That isn't the only way, because not often a lot of specialist um, CBT therapists aren't necessarily accredited. They've worked in research, and they've specialised in those areas. I'm no longer accredited, for example. So, um, I mean, so therefore, you can actually do it by word of mouth, who you think is really good. And this, this organisation is great for that, because I'm sure you're talking to each other and trying to find that people you know are good and you like. The BABC website is really good in that sense as well. But also, there is an aspect that I think everybody said so far, and, and Hafi said this morning about actually, it's worth trying somebody. Because that's it, and trying somebody and then finding out. And not, just because CBT's not worked once, it doesn't mean it won't work the next time or the next time. It's absolutely fine to do that. Some, quite, some places are quite limited in their areas, 
Um, but others have quite a plethora of really good therapists. So this person who lives in Northamptonshire, if you go on the, a good place would be the BABC website, you can search that area and you can then see all the therapists in there. You can ring them up, talk to them, have an idea of that, and that's how it works. And that's this as well. Um, there is a problem in Scotland, unfortunately. Um, Scotland have specialist uh, OCD services, they don't have specialist BDD services. But there are some BDD, um, people who have experience in BDD. I know there's a couple in Edinburgh and there's some in Glasgow. I'm not sure about some of the other areas, so that can be quite difficult. But again, um, you can, there are, I think Scotland is covered on the BABCP website as well, so you can look at Scotland on there. In Northern Ireland, I know there are some absolutely amazing CBT therapists in Northern Ireland, um, and I would start with them. Um, and they will know people, even if they don't do it. I mean, in Northern Ireland, there's, there's a lot of really brilliant CBT therapists who work with PTSD um, because of the troubles and various things as well. They would be uh, probably the best, they will be quite easily Googled, and they will be people I would contact and then ask them about people who are specialists in BDD. So don't be afraid to go to someone you think, oh, they're quite good. I'll, I'll ring them, and I don't mind. I get emails quite a lot to say, oh, Simon, saw you at this, Do you, can you recommend? I'll, I'll, if I know somebody, I'll say, uh, I, I, I can't, you know, I would say, okay, there's a person here who may be interested, or if they can't do it, they will know somebody as well. You should also, though, do try your local services CBT therapists. They are patchy, and some of them are really brilliant, and others may not, may not be so, but it's, a, it's worth starting there. So that. What else? Do antipsychotics work for BDD? Um, Hands up if you think they do. Hands up if you think they don't. <coughs> okay, well, that's the answer. <laughs> Who's for some? No. Um, I, I don't think they do in themselves, particularly. Um, is analy analytical therapy good for BDD? Hands up if you think it is. Analytical, analytical psychotherapy. Right. So kind of pure Freudian therapy. Hands up if you think analytical Freudian therapy is good for BDD. Hands up if you think it's not. Unfortunately, that's the answer. Um, some, people, some people do choose that, and that's absolutely fine. It wouldn't be the first line of treatment. It wouldn't be the second line of treatment for me personally. It wouldn't be the third line of treatment. But if all other things failed, and, you, and you've been to our unit and it's failed and whatever, then some people do choose that to do. But I, I wouldn't recommend it, and there's no evidence that it works. Simon, is it... Yes. Is it worth mentioning that sometimes as part of CBT, your therapist might spend a few sessions yeah visiting um, events in your childhood that might be felt to have an impact. It's not necessarily that that would be psych psychoanalytical therapy. It's more from a CBT point of view. So there might be elements of going back to your childhood, but it would definitely not be the focus of good CBT. Uh, that's a really good point. I think some people think the CBT is all about kind of like the, the doing and the exposure. And what it's not necessarily. Of course we look at you as a whole. We don't just see you as, as that. We look at the whole, we look at the context of that. We look at the background, the understanding of that. And you can understand to put your problem in context of your life, your experiences, um, good or bad, and those things as well. That's definitely part of, of good CBT. Um, and I think sometimes that kind of thrown against CBT has been it's too simplistic, but we do do that a lot. Um, if you came to our unit, where, as Anna says, a 12-week program, the residential unit, you're having, you're having CBT three times a week. So there's a lot of time to understand the context and, and, and fit your problem in your life and your experiences as well, so you know what, what keeps it going, what maintains it, where it's come from, and how, it, how you don't get, that doesn't happen again. So, does exposure therapy work even if you have extreme BDD? Okay, the answer is that to get to average unit, the, the specialist unit at the, at the um, Bethlehem, you've had to fail to CBT at least twice before you get there, and it's a top 1% of severity of BDD and OCD in the country. That's what they treat there. They use CBT and compassion focused therapy is the main stay of treatment, and it is 75 to 80% successful. So the answer is definitely I think exposure therapy is even more important for extreme BDD. It needs somebody who's able to understand that and a therapist who has those skills, but definitely, 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 definitely. And I think it, it, it might be when it's um, very extreme um, BDD that we, we just take things at a, um, at a slower pace to start with. We kind of would unpack everything and just very much go at your pace. Um, and we, we can work with very, very complex BDD within the unit. 
So just having extreme BDD certainly, certainly, certainly doesn't um, exclude you from getting CBT. No, it needs to be done more carefully, and you need to have that inner strength to say, okay, even though I've got really extreme BDD, I'm going to give this a go. And often it's the, the biggest step is actually getting into treatment, and often that's the most scariest thing. Once you get there, you find like anything else, it's, maybe it wasn't just quite as bad as I imagined it and how I kind of visualised it and had these nightmares about it. I am an e EMDR practitioner. Is EMDR being offered effective? Okay. Um, for people who don't know, eye movement desensitization has been shown to be effective for um, PTSD. Um, it's not been shown necessarily to be that, that effective for um, BDD. I wouldn't use it as a first line treatment. I wouldn't use it as a second line treatment either. I would maybe use it if there's um, some traumas involved. It may be a use there, but it shouldn't be used on its own with that sense without decent CBT. So I'll probably know. Any comments on that? Okay. Um, I was difficult on that, comes to that one. Good, so I've done, unfortunately, Northern Ireland. There are some good therapists in Northern Ireland. I would just go for good CBT therapists and then contact them and find out locally who they would see who has good knowledge of BDD. Um, ah, this is a good one. Does it make a difference for a female to see a female therapist? Better understand how the female mind works. A bit sexist, <laughs> but totally understandable. I think I'd say largely not. Um, but again, if someone had a particular reason for wanting to see a female therapist, um, I don't think we'd automatically exclude that. Um, particularly sometimes people who've had um, traumatic experiences in their past involving males, it's totally appropriate to want a female therapist. Um, I think it's just one of those things, it's hard to be, to be blanket about it. I don't know what your view is, Simon. I totally agree. I mean, I suppose I'm male. And um, in case something I realise, and, and often um, people initially, before they actually see me, will think, "Oh, I don't want to. I don't want a man. It'd be really difficult." So I say, "Let's do the assessment, and then we decide." And often, when they meet me, I, I think only once where people say, "Oh, actually, I just thought you'd be female," but then they often come back. It's because it's the right male, is what I'd say, and sometimes we understand that. Um, when we're first understanding the female mind, we're, we're all re reasonably human, and, um, and hopefully, a good therapist can be empathetic and understand those things. Sometimes it's cringy and embarrassing. Um, but often, I found this, especially working with um, females with BDD, where there is kind of um, where there personal problems or difficulties, that um, there is some, sometimes being a man actually has some sort of advantages, actually, a bit separate from those things. And I would listen to what they would say much more, understand it, and then and go for that viewpoint. So not necessarily, don't automatically think you have to have a female to do this. By the way, the majority of the time, you're going to get a female anyway. Because the majority of therapists are females. So I think it's about four, in, four, four to one if not more. So. Uh, right, so that's that one. Most GPs I've encountered have no or little understanding of the disorder. That's true, unfortunately. Um, I think it's a very small percentage who really focus on it. That, that's why I think Colette's advice is really brilliant. You know, print out the information and take it to them. I want them to laminate this stuff and take it to them and say, look, this is my problem, I've done the work, Here's where you need to, to refer me to and do that. GPs will be relieved about that majority and they will say yes and they will start that process off and get netted. You know, really take it upon yourself to say, I'm going to get the best treatment for this. We have um, OCD Action has a GP card yes, which you do. can download, um, print up and, and take to your GP and that explains both OCD and BDD and recommended treatment. Okay, so two more. Can we campaign for joined up NHS, response to BDD um, with professionals? It would be really good to have a, a joined up NHS. Unfortunately, it's been put together piecemeal, um, and that's something which I think you should campaign for, but I suppose I'm really interested in people fighting for their own individual rights. Um, and I would even take that further. I think that OCD Action and that are really, really helpful for that, but like, I know that if you complain higher and higher up, don't be afraid to complain. Um, um, I know at the unit when I was um, one of the units many, many years ago, we had four or five people complain to the MP, and four or five people suddenly got funded. Yeah, I don't know quite how that happened. So <laughs> because they, now, of course, it's a, you know, a kind of parliament that's only got a few people with seats, twelve majority of twelve. Don't be afraid to complain. Get your MPs involved. Suddenly, CTGs and that will, make, will take notice of that. They have to respond. They have to say why. If you're giving a reasonably articulate letter to say, these are my guidelines, this is what I'm expecting, and I'm not getting it, do you complain? And I know they help with complaints, don't they? Stuff yes, like that. Absolutely fine to do that, and you're right to that if it's not there. 
And often um, I'll have a phone call from Colette um, yes. about someone and then quite soon we'll get a, a referral through. So it's, I mean, it's a very powerful part of, I think, using advocacy and collective service. It's really, really powerful. And not enough people do it as well. That's the thing as well. And often people um, suffer in science for so long before actually doing that. OK, a difficult. Well, how do you persuade a teenager in denial of a BDD about the benefits of good therapy? It's not easy. The, 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 the sense is, I suppose, there's two bits about that. First is making sure um, there's information left around, doing those bits. Um, this stuff's up on the website, pointing that as well. There will be a time when that person wants to, there will be, often with BDD, even though um, I talked about this morning about the kind of aspect of um, the lack of, sometimes a lack of insight or denial into the problem, I always see that kind of insight fluctuates. So there'll be a some time where actually the person will think, that, that person will think, yeah, I know I've got a problem, I need, to, I need to kind of do something about this. Now that may not be, last very long, it may be quite a short window, and then kind of the preoccupations take over, and oh no, no, I'm really ugly and terrible again. But there will be that, that fluctuating insight as well. So trying to look for those times when you can bring that up and move into that, that situation. In my last talk on skip picking, I suddenly, I got off on tangents, and I talked about a time where um, I, I do home visits, home assessments, and I drove to the other side of Wales, it's right out on the coast of Wales, um, which is a long way. You get to come, you get to Wales, and you have to do another four and a half hours. It's like miles. And so I got there, and there was this young, eighteen-year-old boy who lived with his mum just there at the house, and he was in his little bedroom where he had his computer. And he was really clear to me. He said, "Simon, I, I know you come all this way, but I don't want this treatment." He said, "You know, I, I, I'm so ugly that I, I, I never need to go out again. I've got my computer. My mum feeds me." What else do I need in life? This is my life now. You know, I, I'm never going to inflict myself on, on anybody because of the way I look. And I, I, I will never go out of this room, but I'm happy like that. And that's how he started. He was kind of almost apologetic that I'd made all this effort to get there. So we started talking. And at some point in that conversation and assessment, you could see he was getting, he was welling up. He was getting really upset because he was beginning to realise that even though he was telling himself that over and over, there was another bit inside of him that was going, no, don't listen to that big voice that's telling you, I want, it, I want help. And I was trying to nurture that. So even though it may seem like somebody's in complete denial, that won't be the case. There'll be, in that, all that forest of blackness, there'll be a teeny little flower that's trying to come out and say, help me, help, help, help. And so we just need to access that, and it'll be there at some point. That young man, he came to our unit, he's done really well, he's now at university. And of course, on discharge, I. I went straight back to the told him again, and we went, we worked that through. He was, he, we were, you know, it was really, really emotional. He said, yeah, I know Simon, and I'm really grateful that I went. But he was quite sure when I first met him that there's no way, sorry, just no way I don't need to do it. I was in total denial. So nobody, I would say, so my answer is nobody's in total denial. Somewhere there, there'll be that kind of ray of light inside that person that knows, actually, this is not how I want to live and not how I want to be. So you need to focus that and nurture that bit. Okay, that was a bit of a long-winded answer, but okay. I think we've covered all the answers, questions. <laughs>